Hello, everyone. Welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. It's Monday, November 23rd. I've got your top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. Thanks for being here to get filled in on the things that are impacting you here in Northeast Ohio. Governor Mike DeWine held an unscheduled press conference today talking about some of the stresses that our hospitals are facing very soon and also a staggering number of new COVID-19 cases, which we will get to in just a moment and give some context around those numbers. But first, there is new promising news about another vaccine. This comes from AstraZeneca in partnership with Oxford University. Now, AstraZeneca is saying that its late stage trials are showing its COVID-19 vaccine could be up to 90% effective. This is after we've heard from both Pfizer and Moderna about their late stage trials showing effectiveness rates of about 95%. Now, here's what's interesting about this AstraZeneca vaccine. Public officials are hoping that this does pan out and does work out through the rest of the trials because it would be cheaper and easier to distribute than the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines mostly because it doesn't have to be stored at those ultra cold temperatures. So the distribution channels that are already in place for vaccines would be able to use, be used in order to get the AstraZeneca excuse me, vaccine out there. And in terms of cost, the AstraZeneca vaccine is expected to be much cheaper because that company has pledged it will not make a profit on the vaccine during the pandemic and has reached agreements with governments and international health organizations to make that $2.50 per dose. Now, if you compare that to Pfizer, Pfizer's vaccine will cost about $20 a dose, and Moderna's vaccine is pricing right now at $15 to $25 a dose. These are based on agreements that both Pfizer and Moderna have struck with supplying the vaccines to the U.S. government. So you can see there's a huge difference in price between the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And these are just a couple of the companies, by the way, that are working on vaccines right now. There are a lot of companies working on them. AstraZeneca is the latest for us to get this information in partnership with Oxford University. Now, these results are based on interim analysis of trials in the UK and Brazil of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, to Governor Mike DeWine's press conference today, which is in public, uh, in process right now. By the way, today is Thank a Public Health Worker Day, so Governor Mike DeWine took a moment to make it a point to thank our public health workers for the work that we're doing. When we are now over 4,000 people hospitalized in Ohio with COVID-19, the medical professionals that joined the governor on the press conference today said that one out of four people who are hospitalized are hospitalized to be treated for COVID. And out of those people being treated for COVID, one out of four of them are being treated in the intensive care unit. Cleveland Clinic Dr. Robert Wiley talked about a conversation that he had with other medical professionals throughout Northeast Ohio, and he said that everyone is starting to be stretched very thin. Dr. Wiley talked about his call with leaders of Metro Health, University Hospitals, and Summa Health, and he said that they're trying to balance the load the best that they can. They're transferring within the system, whether that's in Cleveland, at the Cleveland Clinic, University Heights, or Metro, but they're starting to transfer between systems to balance the load as well. He said that in the Cleveland Clinic system alone, almost 1,000 staff members can't come to work due to COVID-19 exposure or infection, and that it will soon start to impact the ability to run those hospitals. And again, we've heard in previous press conferences from Governor Mike DeWine that these medical professionals are not being infected at the hospital. This is community spread that is impacting these medical professionals. The other healthcare professionals on the call agreed with Dr. Wiley, including Dr. Andrew Thomas of Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, and he said that the hospitals there are also struggling to keep up with the heavily rising caseload of COVID-19 gave the example of the Columbus Convention Center and how previously that had been equipped to handle an overflow of cases, and they have the ability to get that up and running again in about 7 to 14 days if needed, but it takes bodies in order to staff that facility. So it's not just a matter of having the physical space. It's also a matter of having the medical professionals available in order to work on that. All of the doctors agreed, too, that people are best treated at medical facilities and not at these field locations. So the doctors are really stressing the need to get the rate of infections down and not have to move to these situations where they are using these field operations in order to treat the number of COVID patients. And 
The doctors all said that soon medical facilities will need to start looking at postponing procedures in order to handle the COVID cases that are coming in. Governor Mike DeWine was asked if it was time to look at something more severe than the curfew because of the rise in cases. And DeWine said to that that we have to give the curfew time to work and need to give people time to let reality sink in as these numbers continue to go up and go up and go up. Now, we've had more than 7,000 new cases a day for the last week. So DeWine is now saying people still need time to let that reality sink in. He also made the point that early on, lots of people were able to say that they didn't know someone with COVID-19, but now people aren't saying that with every county in Ohio being high incidence of COVID-19. So with that, let's get to the latest numbers of COVID-19 in Ohio. Now, this new number of daily reported cases is very high. It's quite higher than we've seen. But before I tell you the number, DeWine did say that there were at least two labs because of a malfunction who reported two days worth of data in these numbers. He said that the cases were averaging more like 8,900 per day, but the number for today with those malfunctioning labs reporting is at 11,885. So obviously that's a staggering record above what we have seen. But again, that includes at least two labs that had malfunctions reporting two days of numbers in those numbers. So if we look at the testing positive rate for the average over the last week, that's at 12.8% right now. And the latest known daily figure was 13.5%. This was reported on the 21st, so reported on Saturday. We've seen 24 new reports of deaths in the last 24 hours. And right now, the total number of people hospitalized is at 4,358. So we are above 4,000 now. Of those people who are in the hospital for COVID-19, 1,079 of them are being treated in the intensive care unit. So that's about 24%. So almost one in four being treated in the ICU who are in the hospital for COVID-19. Right now, statewide, about 30% of our hospital beds are available for people that need to be treated on an inpatient status, whether that's for COVID-19 or something else. Now let's take a look at the national and the global numbers from Johns Hopkins University. In the U.S., we are now over 12 million cases. That number is 12,305,621. And the total number of deaths related to COVID-19 is 257,072. With 4% of the global population, the U.S. has 20.9% of the COVID cases and 18.4% of the known COVID deaths. Globally, it's almost at 59 million, just on the verge of that, with 58,955,436 COVID-19 cases and 1,393,407 COVID-19 deaths at the global level. Now, as the pandemic continues to surge here in the U.S. and the numbers rise dramatically, President-elect Joe Biden continues to announce picks to fill his cabinet that he hopes to be confirmed by the Senate. So his latest picks include the first Latino and immigrant as the Secretary of Homeland Security, that is Alejandro Mayorkas, and also the first woman to lead the intelligence community, saying that he will choose Avril Haines to be the Director of National Intelligence. A few of the other picks that Biden has put forward are Antony Blinken for Secretary of State, Linda Thomas-Greenfield for U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Jake Sullivan for National Security Advisor, and John Kerry for Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Now, President-elect Joe Biden continues to move forward despite cooperation from President Donald Trump's administration on the transition as the president continues to put forth baseless legal claims that continue to be kicked out of states as those challenges move forward and has yet still refused to concede to Biden. Biden said in a statement that we don't have time to lose when it comes time to our national security and foreign policy. He says, I need a team ready on day one to help me reclaim America's seat at the head of the table, rally the world to meet the biggest challenges we face, and advance our security, prosperity, and values. This is the crux of that team. We have more details on those selections on WKYC.com. Now, taking a look back to yesterday, today is Monday, so I will say happy Victory Monday to you as the Browns won yesterday against the Philadelphia Eagles 22-17 to at First Energy Stadium. We have new news today out of the Cleveland Browns organization that defensive end Miles Garrett, who was absent on Sunday's game because of being placed on the COVID-19 list, will also be out next week against the Jaguars. 
That is because of league protocols. Head coach Kevin Stefanski said, we are ruling him out because that is what the protocols call for. We are just following the rules. We will continue to do. A couple other injuries coming out of Sunday's game. Cornerback Denzel Ward will have an MRI on his calf in the near future, according to the Browns. And the results of that will decide what happens next for Ward in terms of what next week's game looks like in the coming weeks. And he played every single snap in Sunday's win over the Eagles and intercepted his second pass of the season in the fourth quarter in order to help play a part in that win. Safety Ronnie Harrison Jr. is also being considered day-to-day right now because he has a knee injury that he suffered during the first quarter on Sunday. He played just six snaps in the game, but Stefanski says that he is hopeful Harrison will be able to return to face the Jaguars next Sunday, who, by the way, traded him to Cleveland not long before the season started. During the game, you may have caught Baker Mayfield, our quarterback, celebrating on the field when things were going particularly well for running back Nick Chubb. Chubb had a great run, and then Baker was sort of like dancing and skipping down the field. It was great to see. We have that video up on WKYC.com. It took off on the internet. Everyone was absolutely loving it. In the game, Nick Chubb stiff-armed an Eagles defensive end, Joe Osman, and ran for a 54-yard gain. And then his counterpart, running back Kareem Hunt, literally hurdled a Philadelphia Eagle to make a five-yard touchdown run in the fourth quarter. He jumped over another human just right over top of him. It was incredible to see, and Baker Mayfield celebrated that after the game. He said, we have the best backfield in the league. There is no question. Those guys are top five backs each, and there is something special. And Baker said, I get more excited when Nick and Kareem make great plays than when I do, just to be honest with you guys. He says he loves watching those guys run, and he's very happy to have them on the team. He says, whatever it takes to win, I don't care if that's handing the ball off every single time. We are happy to go 1-0 each week, and we have two great backs. Right now, the Cleveland Browns record sits at 7-3, and three, and the Ravens lost on Sunday, so they are now 6-4. and four. So that puts the Cleveland Browns in second place in the AFC North behind only the undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers. That hurts to say. The Steelers are 10-0 and 0 right now. The Browns will face the Steelers again for the very last game of the regular season, by the way, in 2021. And the Bengals are now 2-7, and seven, bringing up the end of the AFC North. Switching gears now, looking ahead to Thanksgiving, if you are preparing food, you might want to check out Betsy Kling's mom's stuffing recipe for Thanksgiving. That's up on WKYC.com. Betsy says that it's great for leftovers. They always make a double recipe so that they'll have enough to snack on it for the days after Thanksgiving. And she says the big key is making sure that the bread gets dry. She says they usually cut and lay the bread out the day before. So that recipe is up on WKYC.com. Betsy even shared a photo of the recipe handwritten out by her mom's late twin sister and a little message in there from her grandma for her mom to not forget the eggs because apparently Betsy's mom would forget the eggs from time to time. But she won't do it now because it's written in there by her mom in pen. Now, as we're talking about Thanksgiving and we're talking about things to be grateful for, something to think about is how we can pay it forward and give people something to be thankful and appreciative for. So in my new podcast, Three Things to Know with Stephanie Haney, I talked this week with the founder of Random Acts of Kindness Everywhere, Ricky Smith, about how to pay it forward even when times are particularly tough. And if you're not aware of how the foundation rake started for Ricky Smith, he literally was at his most down and out. He used the last of the money in his wallet to buy pizza for people. This was at a time when he was living in his car in Los Angeles trying to make it as a writer. So took the last little money in his wallet, bought pizza for strangers, and then the very next day he got a call from the Cartoon Network about a job that really kind of changed things for him. And we talked all about ways that you can pay it forward that don't cost any money. So catch that episode. That's, again, three things to know with Stephanie Haney. You can find that on your favorite podcast platform. Go ahead and give it a subscribe. And speaking of paying it forward, something incredible happened in Cleveland yesterday at Night Town, which is a restaurant that is closing for the foreseeable future because of the advisories in Cuyahoga County. Well, a customer got wind of that and came in for brunch yesterday got just one beer just one Stella and left a three thousand dollar tip to be split amongst the staff at Nighttown here in Cleveland the owner Brendan Ring said he saw the receipt and he chased after the man and he said wanted to make sure that it wasn't a mistake because that's a lot of money and the customer said not a mistake 
Thank you for doing what you do. We appreciate you, and we will see you back after the shutdown. So that tip got shared between the four people who were working brunch on Sunday at Nighttown, definitely sending them off and something that they'll absolutely be needing as they will not be working with their place of employment closed and that's due again to the advisory that was put in place here in Cuyahoga County recommending people not go out except for those essential things while the state is under a 10 p.m. curfew across the state of Ohio. That's it for your 3 News Now update for Monday, November 23rd. I'll see you back here tomorrow for more 3 News Now. Everyone stay safe and be well. I'm Stephanie Haney.